I am Brother Matthew. Thank you for tuning in once again. He will lift up Jesus Delivered by our General Superintendent, Pastor W.F. Kumoye. What I've been thinking about the flaming sword, the ministry of the flaming sword in Genesis chapter 3 is where you find those two words together flaming sword. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 24, so he, referring to God, Drove out the man. And he placed at the east of the garden of Eden, cherubims. And a flaming sword. Those are the words. Which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. The flaming sword that God put with the cherubims. And it says, it turned every way. And it's to keep the way of the tree of life. So that Adam and Eve will not be able to come back into that garden. To take of the tree of life. And live in their sinful, sorrowful condition forever. The flaming sword. What then is the duty? What is the ministry? What is the purpose of that flaming sword? The flaming sword that turned every way. It tells us very clearly here in verse 24. Is to keep the way to the tree of life. Which means to protect the tree of life. So that... An unwanted guest, an unwanted visitor, will not be able to move in, come in to that garden of Eden, and then take of the fruit of the tree of life. But today, what symbolizes for us the flaming sword, the flame and the sword? What symbolizes for us? The flaming sword, the fire and the sword. What symbolizes for us the flaming sword, the fire and the two-edged sword? What symbolizes for us today the flaming sword? And when we know what that flaming sword symbolizes, what is the ministry of that flaming sword in your life? In my life, first of all, determine what the flaming sword is all about. It's symbolism. The flame, the fire, and then the sword. Number one, the fire. In Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 29. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 29. It's not... My word like as a fire, says the Lord. A fire symbolizes the word of God. It's not my word like as fire, says the Lord. That means this word is fire and it burns. And now the sword. We're told in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. Which is the word of God. 
The fire symbolizes the word. The sword represents the word. The fire and the sword both combine together to represent, to symbolize the word of God, the flame and the sword, the flaming sword. When you think of those two words, actually, the real now, the real object is the sword. The flaming just qualifies the sword. Is the adjective telling us what kind of sword is it? A good sword, a sharp sword, a pointing, pungent sword, a cutting sword, a fiery sword, a flaming sword. All those words just describe the kind of sword you have. The flaming sword. The sword is the real thing, but then it's fiery. And it's like a flame. In Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Reading from verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. The word of God, symbolized by the sword, we're even told is it goes beyond even the sword, because we're told it is quick. It is powerful and it is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. And it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Well then, it's very clear. When we talk of the ministry of the flaming sword, we're talking about the ministry of the fiery sword. We're talking about the ministry of the fiery, sharp, two-edged sword. We're talking about the ministry of the mighty, powerful, fiery word of God. The ministry of the flaming sword. We're going to look at the message on a three subtitles. Number one, the symbolic picture of the flaming sword. The symbolic picture of the flaming sword. Number two, the spiritual power of the flaming sword. How powerful, how great, how mighty, how invincible is this word, the spiritual power, the highest kind of power that the word of God has. Then number three, supernatural protection. Through the flaming sword. Supernatural protection. Through the flaming sword. Number one. The symbolic picture. As we come to Genesis chapter 3. Once again. We're looking at verse 24. Genesis chapter 3 verse 24. So it drove out the man. The question is, who drove out the man? The question is, who is the man that was driven out? 
The question is why was the man driven out? The question is after being driven out, did the man have a chance to come back to this Garden of Eden from where he had been driven out? So he, the Almighty God, drove out the man. Why would God do that? Because God had created the whole world for this man. And he had planted the Garden of Eden. And had put all that he would need into that Garden of Eden. And he had given him a responsibility, a work in that Garden of Eden. That he will tend the garden. He will take care of the garden. And then he always came to him in the cool of the day. There was a fellowship because there was a relationship. First of all, a relationship. The creator and the creature. God and his man. In fact, the New Testament Luke says, And Adam, the son of God. That is, when God created him, he created Adam and Eve to be like himself. And he gave him the garden of Eden to take care of, as well as to enjoy all the goodness of the Lord in that garden of Eden. And now we are told so, this God drove out the man. Something had happened. He was, uh, if you think about a tenant in a house, the tenant will keep on living in that house as long as he pays his house rent. And the rent God required from Adam is obedience. That you will not eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge Good of good and evil. That's all you have to pay. Obedience. To the word of the creator. Obedience to the command. Of the one who has given him life. Who has given him the garden. Who has given him all privileges and opportunities. And then Satan came. In the form of the serpent. And said. Did God say? The serpent did not point his attention to, Did God give? Did God supply? Did God create, make this garden for you? Has God given you life? Has God given you privileges? Count your blessings. And see what the Lord has done. For every one thing. That the devil is able to point you. That God has not given you this. There are 100, 1000 other things that he has given you. Count your blessings. Instead of focusing attention on what I don't have. Think of what you have. The life. The joy. The garden. The privilege, the relationship, the fellowship, everything he has given you. Think of what you have instead of thinking of what you don't have. Satan fixed their attention on what the only one single thing they didn't have. That they were not allowed to touch or to taste. As God said. And every time Satan brings temptation to you, he fixes your attention. He fixes your gaze, your focus, your concentration on this little thing you don't 
have. And the great privileges and the great promises and the great provision he has given to you. It turns your mind away from that. As God said, you will not eat. As God said, you will not eat. Of all the trees, the fruit of the garden. And then the woman said, no. We may eat of the trees of the garden. Why don't you concentrate just on that? And go and eat what he has provided. And go and take what he has provided. And your stomach only has space for just this. Every time the devil is asking, as God said, you will not take of this, you reply, God has said, I can take this other one. And then, when you see what God has said you can take, go there and take it. The one you are allowed to take, go there and take it and fill your stomach. When you fill your stomach with what God says you can take, there will be no space anymore for what God says you cannot take. There will be no desire for what God says you cannot take. Take the positive. Feed on the positive. Fill your mind and fill your stomach and fill your life with what is given unto you. And there will be no space anymore for what God has not given unto you. But he did not know that. And that simple wisdom would have delivered her and delivered him, Adam, and delivered us, their offspring, from the calamity they brought unto us. And eventually... He took of that tree, of that fruit, that the Lord had said they should not take. And then, eventually, Adam took it also. Because Eve, the wife, convinced him and said, this is what to take. And then they became naked. The glory of God was gone. The beauty that the Lord covered them with was gone. And then the relationship was broken. The fellowship was broken. You are in the garden as long as we're in relationship together. You are in the garden as long as...